Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon class uh, for, on Colossians. And uh, very glad to see you. My name is Alistair Wilson, and I teach New Testament studies here. And uh, so it's a, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to be with you for this class. And we're going to be looking, as you can see uh, from the screen, at Colossians. Most of you, I think, will uh, have had uh, some experience of uh, the afternoon class before. Let me just uh, urge you, if you haven't already, to um, let us know that you're here by signing in. Uh, that's uh, not only useful for us to know that you're here, but also in terms of regulations, uh, health and safety. And let me just draw your attention to the fact that there are gifted uh, envelopes there, and if you wish to make a donation, uh, then that will be gratefully received. Uh, but we're glad to see you, uh, whether that's possible or not. We're going to pray, and uh, then we will uh, get into our subject. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this privilege of having the text of Scripture, of having time available to us to reflect on that text, and for... Uh, what we can expect to hear from it. Uh, we expect that we will hear your voice. We expect that we will perhaps see some things that are familiar, but we pray also that we will see things we don't expect, that we will also be surprised, uh, challenged, and delighted by what we discover in your word. Encourage us together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, I have to... Remember my technology here, and all being well, it will work. All being well, it will work. There we go. So, I'm going to put up slides there. Um, if you can't read all that's on the slides, uh, don't worry about it. Um, but they're there if they're useful to you. Uh, it will give you a, a guide uh, to what's going on. Most of the slides that I put up on the screen... I've also printed out on the handout. Unfortunately, again, to fit them in, uh, it's not large print, uh, so apologies if the uh, print is too small for you, but at least I hope it will give you a reference point that you can check something up. I also wanted to uh, let you have um, a record of uh, some of the material uh, that you can find online and that you can uh, explore for yourselves. I just want to say a word or two about what we're going to do as we gather together. Uh, we're going to uh, work within an hour, uh, and so I'm going to try and keep discipline to that. I want to uh, read, uh, while we're together, the biblical text itself. It's important that we hear uh, the text and not just about the text. Uh, I'll attempt to comment on issues that seem interesting uh, or puzzling, and uh, I think that uh, it will be very helpful if you have uh, any thoughts that you uh, are coming across as you're reading the text for yourself that you might either share something that you found interesting or raise a question if uh, you find it puzzling and that will lead into a conversation I hope about the things that we find important or difficult. So I hope to speak for about uh, three quarters of an hour and allow ourselves about 15 minutes um, to uh, discuss issues. But if you have a burning question at some point uh, during the talk, you're welcome to put up your hand, and if we can, we'll, we'll pause and just uh, deal with something. But uh, we do save up any questions, scribble something down, and then we can take a little bit of time at the end to have some discussion. I just laid out for you also the plan of the classes. There are six classes altogether. This is the first. And you're welcome to come to whichever ones that you are able. So if you miss a class, uh, then uh, that's not a problem. You're welcome to come back uh, the next time around. Uh, you'll see that there are three classes before uh, the October break and then another three uh, after the October break. I've given them more theological um, titles rather than chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. But there is a broad progression. Uh, there is a sense of moving forward, not exactly chapter by chapter, but systematically through the letter during the, um, the following five sessions that we'll have. This session, uh, I hope to set the scene a little bit for you. 
I included a slide on useful resources, um, just to help you to think a little bit about how you might uh, get the most from studying Colossians. And uh, so there are several things that can help you there. The first, and perhaps the simplest to arrange, is more than one translation of the Bible. Uh, you may well have uh, several translations at home, but if you can read uh, the, the letter in perhaps the ESV and the NIV, perhaps the New American Standard Bible, or for that matter, one of several others, then as you compare the different translations, you'll find that that highlights uh, perhaps areas where the translators found it difficult to express something, or areas where there was some disagreement uh, between translations. And that shouldn't uh, lead us to any lack of confidence in the text, but it can make us aware of things that we need to explore a little more. Now, building on that further, uh, you might want to get a good study Bible. Now, for instance, I have here a copy of the ESV study Bible. Uh, the ESV is a, a good translation, uh, a, a very um, careful translation. It tends towards a slightly more literal uh, approach, and that can be useful, and it can be less readable. Uh, but it's a very good uh, translation, and it's a very good study Bible with lots of useful notes. Uh, it's not exactly a pocket Bible, uh, so um, you may feel weighed down a bit by it, but a very helpful resource, which is effectively like having a series of uh, study resources all kept uh, within, your, um, within your one cover of the, the Bible. But if you want to explore a little further then you might like to get hold of a good commentary. And I've just mentioned uh, several here, which start, uh, which are, some of which are reasonably accessible and some are less accessible, some are more uh, intensive uh, study commentaries. The two more readable ones, uh, one is by my predecessor here as a lecturer at Highland Theological College, Michael Bird. Uh, Mike Bird has written a short uh, commentary uh, on Colossians and Philemon, the two letters are often linked together um, in a commentary series called the New Covenant <coughs> Commentary. Uh, also very helpful is uh, a longer commentary uh, by David Garland, which is part of the NIV application commentary series. And that series attempts to both do careful analysis of the text in its own context, but also to consider how that fits into the wider Bible story and how it fits into a uh, Christian experience in the modern world. So it has kind of three steps to it. Uh, the, the original text, the biblical theology context, and then the modern context. Uh, the like of that Bible can also be purchased uh, as a Kindle uh, version. Uh, and although the, the formatting can sometimes be a little bit uh, awkward for an e-book, uh, nonetheless, it can often be available at a very decent price. The other two commentaries by Mu and Pao are more serious, more demanding, and I wouldn't recommend them as uh, your first port of call if you've uh, never been reading a biblical commentary before. But both are extremely good commentaries, very helpful, and you will tend to find that when you have a question about something, uh, you will be more likely to find the answer discussed and evaluated in the longer commentaries than in the shorter ones. The shorter ones will tend often to have a limited amount of space available and will tend to give you uh, a briefer indication of the issues. So these are just re useful resources. You don't need any of them uh, to participate in the class. You're welcome, apart from a, the Bible text, you're welcome to uh, listen. But if you do want to explore further, then there are some very good resources available. I just want to uh, think for a moment or two about why we should study Colossians? Well, two broad uh, categories of reasons. One is theological, and theologically it's part of the biblical canon, it's part of our Bible, and it is the Word of God. It's, it's the, the Word that comes to us even as an ancient text, uh, as a Word from God to the Church. But there are also some practical uh, reasons that we uh, might consider. One reason for focusing on Colossians is just that it's less well-known than some of the more famous letters. Uh, people often uh, will look to Romans 
as a kind of rounded view of Paul's thought, even though uh, in many ways there are still uh, very specific characteristics to Romans. Or they might look at Galatians because of the fiery uh, difficulty that Paul was addressing there. Or they might uh, know uh, Corinthians again because of the drama and the tensions that are there. Colossians often gets a little bit overlooked, and so that's a good reason just to take time to consider it. But also, it has very positive things to offer. It's very rich in theology. Uh, some of the, the richest uh, descriptions of Jesus Christ are found in Colossians. But also very practical. It discusses uh, a lot uh, of useful things in terms of the way that the community of God's people, the church, should function together. And uh, thirdly, it encourages us to hold on to what is important in Christian faith when Christian faith is under threat. And that makes it very contemporary uh, in our present day. <clears throat> so, what is Colossians? Well, the answer is, it's a Greco-Roman letter. And of course, we often uh, speak about the books of the Bible, or even just the Bible as a book. And that can give the impression, first of all, that the Bible is just one book, when in fact it is multiple documents. And calling Colossians a book can bring to our mind the idea of a book that we're familiar with, something in hard covers with chapters and so on. But Colossians is a letter. It's a letter uh, in some respects, just like we might write uh, from one person to another. Now, it's not just like that, but in some respects, it's very similar. And one of the things, I guess, that uh, is common uh, to what we would normally do with a letter is that we would read it as a whole. I don't know if you uh, can remember the last time you got a letter rather than an email, but if you got that letter, uh, just... Uh, recollect how you read it. Did you read the first two lines and then put it on uh, the, the uh, mantelpiece waiting for the next day when you would read the next two lines? I doubt that very much. I imagine that you read it as a whole, depending who you got it from. You might have read it several times as a whole and not just in little pieces. So what I'd like to do uh, at the beginning of our time is read the whole of Colossians. Now that might uh, seem like a big thing to do and it might seem like a big chunk of our time, but I want to encourage us to hear Colossians as a single document. Now it's not that long, it's four chapters long, and I'm going to read it to you. Um, now you don't have the full text, but you are welcome to follow along in your Bible. Um, but I will read it from the New International Version. And uh, if you... Uh, see things that are a bit different, you're welcome to note them down and we can discuss them uh, as uh, we have time later on. So let me read to you Colossians. I'm not going to tell you about chapter 1 or verse 1 or anything like that. I'm just going to read it uh, because, of course, Paul didn't write chapter 2 uh, at the beginning of the section that he wrote. That's a, a convention that we have to help us find our way around. So imagine that you're hearing a letter read to you, sitting in the church in Colossae, and this is Paul writing to you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood truly God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, 
Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of, the God, of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul's, uh, sorry. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom <coughs> and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the elemental spirit forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, 
and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sexual, sensual indulgence. Since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. <clears throat> Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed, in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other, and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea, and to Nympha, and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And that is Paul's letter to the Colossians. I wonder if you have ever read one of the letters of uh, the New Testament in its entirety in one sitting. Uh, I suspect that in church, uh, I never had done so, uh, and uh, so I hope you find that a useful thing uh, to do. So, Colossians is a Greco-Roman letter. That means that it follows a slightly different pattern from the pattern of letters that we're familiar with in uh, the modern world. We're familiar with certain conventions, uh, dear sir, even if you're writing to somebody who isn't terribly dear to you, you still call him dear, and uh, you're sincerely at the end. And just in the same way, there is uh, a certain pattern and convention uh, to the way in which letters were formed in the Greco-Roman world. Let me just say a word about what I mean by the Greco-Roman world. Uh, you can hear probably that that's a combination of Greek and Roman. Now, the Greek influence uh, came several centuries before the New Testament time, 
uh, particularly through the dominance of Alexander the Great. Alexander that great, that uh, great Greek general, who um, extended his empire throughout much of the Eastern Mediterranean world. And one of the strategies he used for bringing some coherence to his, uh, his empire was that he uh, encouraged, developed the use of Greek. Now, Greek was an ancient language. Uh, classical Greek uh, was a very nuanced language and some great literature, Homer, uh, and uh, other uh, great documents came from that Greek. But it was quite demanding for people who uh, were not naturally um, Greek speakers. And so what developed through Alexander's efforts at promoting Greek was what is known as Common Greek or Koine Greek. And it was the Greek of the streets. It was the Greek that could be easily uh, gathered by most people. So it didn't have some of the technical nuances that uh, the uh, classical Greek had, but it was usable, and it became what is known as the lingua franca, the uh, language of trade. And uh, using uh, Greek then became something that was possible for people from Israel, from Palestine, people from Asia Minor, people in Rome, uh, people in Greece itself, even down onto North Africa, uh, and uh, so this one language became a common linguistic bond in much the same way as English has become in the modern world, which meant that people from different uh, groups, different places, could nonetheless communicate with each other. And so by the time that we get to the New Testament, the political uh, power has shifted from the Greek uh, empire to the Roman Empire. It's now the Romans that are in power. But they couldn't shift the significance of Greek for linguistic uh, communication, for um, trade, and so uh, Greek remains significant, and that's why we have a New Testament that was written in Greek rather than in Latin, uh, because even though the Romans were the uh, political power, it was the Greek language that was used for day-to-day -day communication. So we've talked about uh, the idea that a letter typically has a structure. You can tell that Colossians is a letter, not because it says the letter of Paul to the Colossians in the top of your Bible, but because it has certain features in the text. We'll not take much time over it, but you can see right away that there's a very easy structure to recognize in the first few verses of Colossians 1. <clears throat> Paul, and then he describes who he is. Two, God's holy people in Colossae. And then finally, grace and peace to you. So we have author, recipients, and some kind of greeting. And into each of these very simple things, Paul uh, puts great rich theology. We also find that just as there would have been in many uh, regular letters of the day, there is a thanksgiving section and a prayer. Now many uh, Greco-Roman letters would be thankful and praying to all kinds of gods and goddesses, but Paul directs his thanksgiving and prayer to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there is uh, the, the core of the letter, which I've simply described as the body, and finally, there would be some personal greetings. Who wrote the letter? Well, you might think that this is a, a silly question because it says quite clearly who wrote the letter. Uh, and I only raise this quickly uh, because it is a contested issue. Uh, so the, the letter quite clearly states that Paul is the author. Yet, in uh, recent history of careful uh, academic study of the Bible, some people have said, well, it doesn't sound like Paul. And uh, there are some ideas or words that are uh, a bit different from what we expect in other letters, and so we think it might not be by Paul. Although people have disputed this, and I don't want to go into this in great depth, I think that there are some good reasons for accepting that Paul is the author. 
The first is simply that all the manuscripts, the copies that have come down from the ancient world that we possess, have Paul as the author. We don't have any that miss out Paul, and we don't have any that have somebody else in in place of Paul. So that has to count for something. Also, there are many personal references to uh, Paul in the letter. Uh, we might think, for instance, uh, of uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Um, you heard, learned the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Uh, Paul speaks of his knowledge of Epaphras. You'll remember at the end of uh, the letter that there are various greetings, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. And then in verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Now what's going on there is that in the ancient world where literacy was not all that widespread and where um, generally people employed professional scribes, partly for their skill and partly because the materials were also expensive, the pens, the ink, uh, the papyrus, it was very common to ask somebody to write a letter for you, but then you would add something that distinguished it, just like we type uh, our uh, word process, a letter, but then add our handwritten signature. It would be common to do that to say, this is truly by me. So if this were not by Paul, then this is pure deception to say, I, Paul, add uh, my hand, because if uh, it is not Paul, then it is uh, not true to the very nature of what that claim is making. Uh, that is, here I authenticate that it really is me. So if somebody did that uh, in, uh, and it wasn't Paul, then that would seem to be particularly um, out of character with a letter that includes the uh, instruction, do not lie to each other. And then, uh, thirdly, the theology, although it may be distinctive, is consistent with what Paul teaches in other letters that are recognized to be by him. That is to say, although he may tackle particular issues, and although he may address them uh, in a specific way, and perhaps use language that is um, tailored for the needs of that circumstance, it is not the case that he says anything that is in direct contradiction or even in significant tension with what he says elsewhere. And so I'm uh, going to accept the face value of the letter that it is Paul who wrote it. Where was Colossae? Uh, well, uh, if you can see uh, the map on the right, that gives you some sense of the, the Mediterranean world, uh, what we might call broadly the Greco-Roman world that reflects uh, the kind of Roman Empire. And then uh, on the left, you'll see this uh, close-up shot of what is, uh, if I move over for just a second to point it out, uh, you've got this area here, uh, what we would call Asia Minor in the ancient world, or in the modern world, what would be Turkey. So uh, you'll see Colossae marked uh, with a dot there on the western part of, uh, of Turkey, of Asia Minor, very close to Ephesus, about 100 miles from Ephesus, and also even closer to Laodicea, which is mentioned in the letter. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, the, um, the quotation, although I'll leave it with you, this quotation from David Garland. But what's interesting about it is that he mentions that there was a, um, an earthquake, uh, an earthquake that took place in the early AD 60s. And so that gives us a kind of limit on when Paul could have written to the Colossians, because uh, it seems that uh, towards the early 60s AD, Colossae was either significantly damaged or possibly destroyed uh, by this earthquake. So that ties in uh, with much of the view of when this letter might be dated. Most people identify it as being a prison letter, a letter that was written when Paul was under house arrest in Rome. There is some debate about that, but I'll not go into the detail at this stage. But if that is the case, then we're probably talking at about a time in the early 60s AD. Just a little 
quotation, forget that when I press that it doesn't work there. Um, this is a quotation from Tacitus, uh, a Roman historian from the Annals, and I've just put it in because it's useful as much as possible to have a look at ancient sources when you're trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, Tacitus includes this little phrase, one of the famous cities of Asia, Laodicea, which we know was a, a neighbour of Colossae, was that same year overthrown by an earthquake and, without any relief from us, recovered itself by its own resources. So uh, Laodicea seems to have responded very well to the difficult circumstance of the earthquake, but Tacitus gives us some sense of that devastating event that took place, and that can be dated through cross-referencing with the various um, things that are mentioned to about the AD 61-62 time. Okay, why is Colossians written? Why did Paul write this letter? Well, hopefully as we go on through this series of classes, we'll see in some detail some of the features of the text that give us these ideas. But I think we can identify a number of broad issues that Paul had in mind. One was to encourage the Colossian believers to continue to believe the gospel and to grow in Christian maturity. Uh, one thing we'll pick up in the next class is this interesting phrase, uh, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And uh, so Paul has this sense that the gospel is producing uh, results in the church in Colossae as elsewhere. But then a little bit later on in the same uh, section of text in 110, he says, we, can, uh, we ask that God will um, fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And so we find that same sense of bearing fruit and growing being repeated twice, and I think that gives us a clue to what lies at the heart of Paul's concerns. Secondly, we can say that it was written that the Colossian believers would see the wonder of who Christ is and what he has done. So there's a very strong Christological emphasis in Colossians. There's a very strong emphasis on who Christ is, what he has accomplished. But also there is an element of uh, negative or warning um, to the Colossian letter to encourage the Colossian believers to reject false teaching. And Paul has a certain uh, part in chapter 2 where he's very firm in saying don't allow false teaching to disrupt your understanding of the gospel. Then to encourage the Colossian believers to have a heavenly Christ-centered perspective on reality. One of the fascinating texts is at chapter 3 and the first few verses where Paul says, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your minds on things above. And then he says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears. So he identifies the believer's life with the person of Christ seated in the heavenly realms, which uh, certainly deserves more reflection and is certainly a distinctive theme in Colossians. Then we have, uh, finally, to encourage the Colossian believers to live as a community in a manner consistent with their union with Christ. Often in Paul's letters you have, since this is the case theologically, therefore live like this. And that's the, the dominant note in chapter 3, where there is a strong emphasis on how we should live, not only as individuals, but as a Christian community. How does this uh, letter relate to others? Well, I've already mentioned it's a prison letter and it, uh, it has reflections. You'll see um, Paul referring to him being in chains uh, and we find uh, similar references to him being a prisoner in Philippians, in Ephesians and especially in Philemon. There are strong emphases, uh, strong similarities to Ephesians. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through these in detail, but you'll see them on the, uh, the sheet. Uh, various texts which I've identified, I've drawn particularly from 
a, a post, uh, a blog post by an academic, um, and I've added a few of my own, uh, and uh, that reference is later on on your sheet. But uh, you'll see uh, reference, for, in, uh, for instance, in whom we have redemption, occurs in both Colossians and Ephesians. Christ above the spiritual powers in both letters. Christ is head of the body, the church, reconciling those who were alienated. Uh, the mystery of Christ. Rulers and authorities. The body grows from the head. Uh, do not lie to each other. This phrase, psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, quite a distinctive phrase which is found in both Colossians 3.16 and in Ephesians 5.19. This body of text giving instructions to different um, parts of the household, which is often known as a household code. And then this fascinating little bit, uh, which is that there's a, a section of Colossians 4, 7 to 8, and of Ephesians 6, 21 to 22, which is virtually word for word the same. So here's... Uh, quotation from uh, this man, Ken Schenk, uh, who provided me with a lot of these references. At one point, he says, Ephesians is exactly the same as Colossians for over 25 words straight, namely at the end when commending Tychicus to the audiences. Now, I've put that up um, just so you can see it, and you probably can't see an awful lot about it there. But not only have I put up the English of the ESV, but I put up the Greek, um, not because I'm anticipating that you'll all be fluent in Greek, but because Greek is a language that is quite flexible in the way that you can express things. It's an inflected language, and so the function of the word in the sentence is not determined by word order, but by the endings that are attached to the word. So although um, in English, uh, the dog bit the man means something different from the, um, the man bit the dog, uh, just because of word order. In Greek, the, the subject and the object would be expressed by the shape of the word, by changes in the ending. And for a, for a language that can be as flexible as Greek, to be virtually identical for two lines of text is really quite remarkable in exactly the same word forms and order. So that suggests that for some reason or other, and in some way or other, one of these texts was drawn exactly from the other of the texts. Some distinctive themes and content, and we're nearly at the end. So, uh, one or two of these things I've mentioned already. The gospel bearing fruit and growing. A hymn. I put that in inverted commas because it doesn't necessarily mean what we mean, but a kind of poetic, grand use of language about Christ in chapter 1, 15 to 20. Defeat of powers and authorities. Reconciliation. Rejection of the hollow and deceptive philosophy. The fullness of the deity in Christ, a theme that gets repeated twice in Colossians. Believers who are raised with Christ, who is their life and the household code. So I hope that you will see from that that there is a lot of rich material in Colossians. It's a fascinating, specific letter written to a specific um, people in a particular place and time to address a particular issue which Paul was concerned about. He was concerned that they would grasp the gospel and that their grasp of the gospel would enable them to resist the uh, challenge of false teaching. But that same letter addressed to those very specific circumstances becomes for us a letter which can shape our understanding of Christ and challenge us to live as part of a Christian community in the way that uh, Paul would have desired and which reflects the very character of God. So that is where we end. And uh, so we have a few minutes, I think, uh, to uh, offer you the chance to raise any questions you might have uh, about Colossians, whether they've directly come up in what I've said or whether there are other questions that, um, that you've been thinking about. So would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment 
about Colossians. Yes? Does the fact that there are six distinctive similarities in the Greek, does that lead to a discussion as to whether one is directly copied from the other or one is not false, one is false and one is true? Well, I don't think the issue of whether one is false and whether one is true would necessarily be the first layer. I think the issue of whether one is a direct copy of the other um, certainly uh, is raised by that. Now, the interesting thing is that most of the letter, uh, the two letters, are not so directly connected. So there's something interesting about that particular uh, passage. But it's quite feasible, for instance that it could still have been Paul, uh, or Paul's secretary, uh, who wrote both down, but for different purposes. Now, for instance, if I can just divert from Colossians for a moment, uh, one of the interesting things about Ephesians is that, um, well, there are a few interesting things about Ephesians that have also raised questions about whether Paul would have written uh, Ephesians. Uh, one is, one particularly strong one is, that it has almost no personal greetings. When you compare it with Colossians, uh, almost no personal greetings. And that seems extremely strange for a church at which Paul was pastor for a considerable time, and which when he said farewell to the Ephesian elders, he burst out in, in tears. So why would he write to the Ephesians in a, a way that was so dispassionate? And one of the arguments that has come through in recent years uh, is that, in fact, Ephesians was designed as a circular letter. As, uh, and there is some support for that, because there are some manuscripts that we have from the ancient world that while they all have Paul as the author, they don't have the, the word, they don't all have the words in Ephesus in the address. So that might mean that Ephesians was designed to perform one function, to be a circular letter providing teaching to perhaps several churches, including Laodicea, maybe Colossians, maybe others. And that, in comparison, Colossians was much more specifically addressed to um, one community within that uh, area. And therefore, if they were two documents that were designed for different purposes, but nonetheless written about the same time, then perhaps they would still have been they would have one, one would still have been to hand as uh, the other was produced. However, it certainly does raise a question that requires some reflection, and um, I suppose it fits in then with that whole question of is this by Paul or is it not? So it's a, it's a very interesting feature. I hadn't, uh, before today, I hadn't quite uh, been struck by how exact the, um, the similarity is. Anything else that folks would like to comment on or ask? Yes. A quite a superficial reaction, but I was thinking of what we were saying at the beginning about us getting letters today, and, and often if we receive a letter, but you know, we go into two categories, so there's, there's those we're pleased to receive, <laughs> and those perhaps from the tax fund or something which we're, we're not so pleased to yep. receive. But my reaction to hearing you read the letter, and I never heard it read actually so well in, in one piece, was uh, I've been pleased to got the letter. I, I felt... <laughs> Paul would have been trying to very much encourage me. He was being, you know what it's like when you were perhaps, um, as I have been a teacher at one stage, when you sort of put something which you're trying to encourage someone or you're trying to give a bit of a ticking off. I felt there was an encouragement in it. There was obviously mm. some criticism, but it was a, a, a sort of a, a, a letter I would have been pleased to receive. And the sort of thing you would say, you know, can you read it again? Mm. Um, so I felt he was... You know, it was, it was very positive, very building up. It was a, mm. a nice letter to get. He was, he was trying to encourage yep. rather than tick off so much. That's very helpful. In fact, I must remember before I say anything to repeat the question because it may not be picked up for the, um, for the video. So the first question was just about uh, whether that uh, exact wording uh, issue at the end of um, Ephesians and Colossians was had an impact on the whole authorship question and then your own comment about um, this being a positive tone in uh, Colossians rather than a negative critical one absolutely it's a very different tone for instance from Galatians where uh, you're getting some severe ticking off uh, uh, going on there 
Uh, no thanksgiving in Galatians, straight into I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. And, oh foolish Galatians, and there's nothing of that in Colossians. There are some, some warnings, but it strikes me more like the warning um, of a parent who sees uh, that their child might go near the fire, uh, rather than uh, the, the scream, perhaps, of a parent who sees that the child has already uh, gone to the fire. Um, so it is, not, it is not a stop doing it, but it is more a be careful of your situation, be careful of uh, your context. And it seems to me that what he does in the thanksgiving and prayer is say, I'm grateful for all I see of God's activity in your community, in your lives, so don't stop there, but rather continue on that track because you're in dangerous territory, not because of what you're doing, but because of the circumstances. And therefore, be vigilant that uh, you are not um, put into a position where that causes devastation. So absolutely, I would say that if you receive this, you might hear some serious tones, but broadly speaking, you're getting an encouraging word, a word that would, um, would make you think, yes, that's, uh, that's good to hear, I'm encouraged to hear that, uh, let, me, let me hear it again. Anything else that folks would like to, to comment on? Sorry, yes, um, okay, I'll, at the back and then I'll come to you. In the version that you read from, uh, you said, in him were all things created. In mm. the authorised version, it says, by him, and that is consistent with what we have in John's Gospel. Yep, yeah, it is, uh, there's a, a marvellous opportunity for a Greek lesson, which I'll try and restrain <laughs> myself from, but, uh, but the, the little phrase, enarche, um, so, uh, in the beginning, um, that, that N, that N, is known as a dative, um, and it can be used to express um, location, or it can be used to express instrumentality, by means of. And there's nothing in the word itself that tells you which one of these it is. So you then have to choose by context which is the, so, so in the case of um, by him, then in fact, it would be perfectly legitimate, and it's the good argument for learning Greek, to hear almost both nuances there, that everything was created both by him and in him. Uh, the, the sense of that he is, he is the, um, the one uh, in whom we live and move and have our being, but he is also the one by whom the heavens and the earth were made. So that's where translators have a real problem. It's like, it's similar to John 3, uh, where um, Jesus says, unless you are born anothen. Now, anothen in Greek can mean both from above and again. If you're an English translator, you have to choose. But if you read it in Greek, you don't. That, that in fact, you can hear both of these um, nuances, and that's why some translations say you must be born again, and some translations say you must be born from above, and almost certainly that's why Nicodemus got so confused, because Jesus was was saying you must be born from above, and Nicodemus was hearing you must be born again, and that's how he says how can I be born again and enter into my mother's womb. So it's one of these places where the Greek has more flexibility of meaning than the English can cope with, and the poor English translators have to make a choice. They can't say nothing, or unless they go the, um, the Amplified Bible approach and they just put them both in. Uh, so that's why you end up with that kind of discrepancy. Yeah, I think our time's going, but uh, yes, sir, uh, did you have a... <clears throat> struck me when you were reading uh, chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, For though I am absent from you in body and present with you in spirit, which... I can understand, I might say that mm -hmm. today, he then goes on to say, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is, which just kind of begs a speculative question, is, is it a turn of phrase or why didn't he say, I'd like to hear how orderly you are, is he 
somehow there. <laughs> it, it's a very good point, and commentators discuss what what does it mean to be with you in spirit? Uh, does it mean to be in the sphere? It's a bit like the gentleman's question about in Christ, that we are sort of in the presence of Christ together. Or does it mean that I am in my mind thinking very much of you? So it is interesting that he uses that language of see, because we have, um, we get this, the clear sense that Paul has not visited Colossae, that he's not personally been there, but rather that he is getting his information from uh, Epaphras, uh, who is mentioned at the beginning. It's from him that Paul hears of the good things happening. So it is an intriguing choice of words. I have to say I don't have um, any sense of exactly what nuance that might mean. I suspect it's more figurative, uh, but it is intriguing. Friends, I think that our time has gone. Uh, I'm happy to, to speak to anyone who um, has, doesn't have to rush off and who wants to, uh, to ask me about something. That's absolutely fine. But for the sake of the, the rest of you folks, uh, thank you for coming along. I hope you'll be able to make it uh, again. I hope you found it interesting and uh, look forward to seeing you for another session of being well. So let's close with prayer. Our Father, we commit ourselves into your care. We pray that uh, as we have heard your word, as we have read it, and as we have thought about it, its effects would linger. Its effects would, uh, would be like that. A gospel that bears fruit and grows in our lives, that there would be an organic change because of being, in, of being exposed to your word. So encourage us, keep us safe, and uh, we pray that we'll be able to meet again in the future to reflect on your word more. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much indeed, folks. Thank you.